everybody. My name's Sandy Beach, and I'm an alcoholic. How you all doing? Thank you very much for inviting me here. I've had a wonderful time. It's been a great weekend. Congratulations to those of you that picked up um, those three big books with uh, six days. I wouldn't have had the guts to come up anywhere with six days, so I'm absolutely excited for you. My sobriety date is uh, December 7th, 1964, and um, I've had the same sponsor for almost 39 years. So I'm a very lucky member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, and my home group is the Saturday Night Fever Group in Tampa, Florida. <laughs> and we meet on Saturday night, and we have two speakers, and we have a lot of fun. So if you're ever in Tampa, look up that group, and if I'm not on the road, I'll be there. And uh, we just insist on having fun. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think uh, is important for anybody who is new here that that's what AA is designed to do, is to enable you to be happy without alcohol. And if anybody had told me that I could get happy without alcohol, I would say what anybody new would say, well, you don't understand. Every time that I'm without alcohol is when I'm miserable. Alcohol is what fixes my problems. So your idea of not drinking is absurd. How could I stay miserable and sober for any extended period of time? And the answer is you can't. It just becomes too much. That's why going on the wagon is such a heavy load. And you know when you're on the wagon, any time I tried it, I knew that every day that went by I was getting one day closer to my next drink because I couldn't stand it much longer. I mean, how long can you take all of this pain? And so that was my vision of sobriety, was that it would just be an endurance contest of some sort. And little did I know that by following these 12 steps and by getting in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous, a transformation would take place where the world looked like a wonderful place without any alcohol in my system. And um, I like to think of sobriety as being in a position where there's nothing for alcohol to fix. And when there's nothing for alcohol to fix, it's real easy to not drink because you just don't need it. You don't need it for anything. It just doesn't occur to you to have a drink. They say that um, when a problem is addressed spiritually, it's entirely different than when we address it through the normal course of events. Normally, we speak of solving a problem. That's the most normal way of, you know, well, I got this problem, but I finally figured out a solution, and then I solved the problem. But in the spiritual realm, we don't solve them. They get removed. They just don't exist anymore. And so the sobriety is... Um, not fighting alcohol anymore. I never dreamed this could happen. And I guess I've been sober about six months, and I'll never forget the shock that I felt. It was almost like something was terribly wrong. I realized I had forgotten to think about drinking last week. <laughs> and it was so scary, I almost made a little note. Don't forget to worry about drinking, because <laughs> I've been doing that forever, and all of a sudden, it was almost like I forgot to worry about drinking. Well, that's what sobriety is. It just doesn't come up on the agenda to fight. It's just not there. And so if you're new, you're in for a much more happy sobriety than you can imagine. It doesn't look like it could happen, but it does. They say the 12 steps are a series of actions that we take that we don't believe in. Because if you look at them, you just don't see any answers in there. I remember looking at those steps. My sponsor said, everything that you need in these 12 steps, you know, the standard speech that you get in the beginning. And I remember going home and I'm going, this is going to really address my problems. And I started studying those things. And I, I, like any new person, I had one primary problem and I was looking for the money step. <laughs> and... Uh, You, there's nothing about getting any money in any of those steps. 
And I remember telling my sponsors, what about the money step? What about um, this? And he said, well, we have these promises. And he said, I know it's, it's almost impossible for you to conceptualize this yet. But we can address fear of financial security without any money. And I remember going, you can? And he said, yes. We just removed the financial insecurity. And you're broke, but you're not worried about being broke. <laughs> it's just not important. And I thought that sounded a little far-fetched, you know what I mean? I'm going, well, I'll humor him. And uh, I'll tell you, I was so broke my first 15 years in AA that I really, but I had a wonderful time. I just had a great time. And it was just part of life with I had six kids. I got just thrown out of the Marine Corps trying to find a job and pay for all these things. And uh, it was a real struggle, but I had the best time. I just had just as much fun as the guy who had a lot of money. And that was a freedom that I didn't know you could have, that you could solve a financial problem spiritually with no money. It seemed impossible. Very briefly, I just want to talk a little bit about my story. I like talking more about AA than my story. I have heard it a few times. <laughs> it had the same ending. I could really go, you know, I drank a lot, and then I got an AA, and everything's great. And that would be a one-minute version of the entire talk. But um, I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut in the 30s, and my parents were... Uh, had been through the uh, depression, so they were really worried about money and um, job security and things like that. But they provided for my sister and I pretty good. And by the way, my sister has 26 years in AA, so we've gotten quite close. When she came around here, we suddenly had a whole new relationship, and that has meant a lot. And she's very active in the New Haven, Connecticut area, and goes to meetings and sponsors people and just amazing and um, brought up in the Catholic Church and I had my uh, my sister was right next to me we often talk about this and the Catholic Church scared me to death and I took everything literally you know what I mean and they said this and I just heard those nuns and I was a little kid out there so scared to death my sister's over there three years younger than I am just going Hey, take it or leave it. Who cares? This is cool. I'm happy in here. And she wasn't buying into this stuff in the literal sense. And so her relationship with that church has just been very comfortable and happy and wonderful, whereas mine was, uh, it was terror. And I had this, what I call a spiritual awakening when I was about um, eight years old, maybe nine. And I've been studying the catechism. I've been studying every little thing and thinking about it, thinking about punishment and being bad and the amount of trouble I was already in as an eight-year-old. And I was sitting in church one day and the crucifix was hanging down in this church. It must have been 20 feet high, great big wooden crucifix. You could not miss it. It was right there. And I was sitting there looking at it when all of a sudden it was like, Something spoke to me from the universe, and it gave me an insight that I hadn't had before. And it said, little boy, do you see this crucifix? I said, yeah, yeah. Well, this is what God did to his only son that he loved. Guess what he's going to do to you? (laughs) And I fell off the pew in a faint. And they carried me out. And they went, people said, what happened? I said, oh, I had something for breakfast. You know, I wasn't going to tell anybody. And I, I'm a typical, like you, rest of you alcoholics. Don't ever tell anybody about anything. Much safer to figure it out yourself. <laughs> so I've scared myself for years with that one. And so as life unfolded, I I did have um, polio as a little kid. I had that epidemic, went through a lot of New England. And I was lucky that the Sister Kenny treatment got my arm and leg back working. But it was kind of a traumatic thing where you just got zipped out of your house and then nobody could come see you because of the quarantine. 
they weren't quite sure what was going on, and so I, that reinforced my feeling that I really didn't belong in that family. You know what I mean? That I was some from some other planet, or I just didn't connect anywhere. And it's taken a long time in AA to feel like I'm the same as everybody else. And so I had that little feeling, uh, but I did well in school. Went to a little prep school in New Haven and was got very high grades and was on a lot of athletic teams and it pumped. It was a feeder school right into the Ivy League and so I went to the Yale and I didn't have any. I hadn't been drinking at all and I got there and of course people are going, "You're not drinking. You're in college. This way, come on, party. We're going to have fun. It makes you feel wonderful." No, no, I'm going to not drink. But at, somewhere in the, but I'd been there about three or four months. And I went to, I always tell this in my story, I went to this um, social function where you were supposed to meet the other 30 guys that were in the room. That was just, that's all you had to do. Go in and meet all those guys, find out where they're from, just chit-chat. Well, that was terrifying to me um, because I, I knew that I didn't belong there, that all these guys were much better than I was. They came from all over the United States and they were wealthy and they were smart and they were rich. And I was an imposter that was in this class and they hadn't caught me yet. That was my self-esteem. So going up to meet people, I would, I would start up to these groups that were in the room and as I approached them, they looked at me and gave me that, you ever see people's eyes and they tell you, you know, don't come near me. And I, so I saw that in the first group, you know, we don't want to know you, don't join our group. And I just, well, actually I'm going over here and then I went over there and they didn't want to know me. and. I made a tour around the room and just could see from people's faces that they had enough friends already and they did not want to know me. So I never shook anyone's hand. I made the entire tour of the room and I started to leave, which is what I always did if something is making me anxious, is to just go away from it. But there was a bar there, and there was a bartender. So I walked up, and I'm thinking about my roommates. You know, you ought to drink and make you feel good. You ought to drink and make you feel good. I said, oh, I'm going to have a drink. So I went up and ordered some whiskey something, whiskey and soda, and it tasted awful. And I sat there talking to the bartender and drank it, and nothing happened. I didn't feel wonderful. If I had another one, I didn't feel wonderful. Had a third one. was about halfway through. Still didn't feel wonderful. Put the drink down. I assumed that it wasn't working. And I turned around to leave, and I looked back at that group, and those guys were gone, and they'd been replaced by 30 of the friendliest guys I've ever seen. <laughs> I took a look in their eyes, and every guy in that room wanted to know me. You could just see it. They were begging me to join their group. You know, they're all, no, don't join that group, Sandy. Join our group, please, please. And I looked around. I just said, God, the world has been transformed into a wonderful place filled with wonderful people. That was my feeling. I said, God, I love this world. I've never loved the world up until that moment. The world was very frightening and intimidating. For the first time in my life, I thought the world was great. And then I felt different. I had a little spring in my step and I'm snapping my fingers. And I'm actually thinking to myself that they're lucky that they're going to meet me. <laughs> and I had something to say. It didn't matter where they were from. You know, hey, I'm from Wisconsin. Hey, Badger. Blah, blah, blah. You know, it was almost like I intuitively knew how to handle situations <laughs> that were baffling me ten minutes earlier. And so I had this incredible sense that I had discovered a great secret to life that was solving problems that went back as far as my memory could take me. That's how powerful alcohol was. I had found something that solved everything, all these things that were bottled up inside of me. It took away all that anxiety and fear and confusion and allowed me to be in touch with my own creativity with other people for the first time ever. I could finally be me. I didn't sit off on the side and be afraid to share my thoughts. I could be me. It was almost like I finally found the on switch to turn on 
my brain and myself. And it was just a very powerful experience. So I went back to the bar, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> if a little is good, then a lot is going to be wonderful. And of course, 20 drinks later, or whatever it was, I'm lying in the floor in the bathroom and the room is spinning and I'm throwing up and it just it was awful. And I remember the next day having, you know, a hangover that was close to death. Just just as bad. As, I didn't know anybody could feel that bad. And I got up and went in, had some ice water, I think, and sat there just aching. And the thought occurred to me, well, are you going to drink again tonight? And the answer was like that. I said, of course I am. This little suffering here is a very small price to pay for what I had last night. So I had already cut the deal. I had already made that decision that what I got from alcohol was worth everything. So if somebody had come up to me, you know, a little, little, little movie or something, and they, they said, the devil came in and said, all right, you want to choose alcohol? Yes, I do. I want a permanent relationship with alcohol. Well, would you be willing to give up your high grades? Yes. I mean, I wouldn't have even thought about it. Would you be willing to give up athletics? Yes. Would you be willing to give up your self-respect? Yes. I mean, I had already cut the deal that day. I've only been drinking 18 hours. You know what I mean? And I'm already, yeah. Yeah, take away my family. Take, I don't care what you take away. <laughs> I am not giving up what I had last night. I will give up anything to get that, and that's what I did. And that's what you did. You didn't know you were making that deal when you first started drinking, but as your life unfolded, just like mine, you slowly gave up everything in the attempt to keep this incredible gift Alcohol was not a problem. It was the solution to my problems. For non-alcoholics, you will never get a non-alcoholic and ask them. I remember asking my roommate 25 years later. He was a big drinker, but a social drinker. But we got drunk a lot, and we partied. And then I was in AA maybe 20 years, and I was speaking in Dallas, and I went out with him, and I said, he came to the meeting. He just loves AA because it saved me. <laughs> and... Uh, and we have a lot of fun together, and we talk and joke about booze and sobriety and all these things. So I was asking him, Roy, looking back 25 years, if somebody were to ask you about alcohol, what would you say? And just what is your, what's popped into your head? Alcohol, what does that mean to you? So he sat there and he said, well, alcohol makes food taste better. That was his entire summary of, of, of alcohol. I almost felt like asking him, is that going down or coming up? <laughs> now, you and I would never answer the question that way. And he would never have said, oh, alcohol, it's the secret of life, <laughs> which it was for us. And so that's why he's not an alcoholic, because alcohol did not transform him in the world that he lived in. So he wasn't prepared to give up what I was prepared to give up. Why would he give it up just to make food taste better? He wasn't going to puke blood for a couple of years just so food tastes better. But if it transformed your life and solved every problem that you ever had, drinking was close to a spiritual experience. It was a transforming event where the world became pleasant to live in and I became somebody. And when alcohol wasn't present, I was nobody and the world was intimidating and it was painful to live in the world sober. So anytime somebody said to me, why don't you not drink? I went, why? I'll be in pain all the time and I can't get in touch with my creativity. I can't be, I can't be anybody. So it would never occur to me to not drink. So with those decisions firmly in place, 
within a very few months of drinking, I was prepared now to go out and pay the consequences. And uh, that's what I did. I just was, I just somehow graduated. It was uh, very close. My grades got so bad. I got arrested. Started getting my teeth knocked out. You know, all the things that happened. And it, as each event would happen, I would go, so what? You're in jail. So what? It's nothing compared to what you get from booze. It wasn't even a close call. Uh, the Korean War was going on. Everybody, the draft was there. You had to join the military. So a group of guys are drinking beer. They said, let's join the Marine Corps. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to join the Marine Corps. Boy, I got down there a few months later, and um, I, I just remember going, wow, these guys are intense. Don't they ever lighten up? I mean, what's this? <laughs> hey, guys, hey, guys, you know. Let's have some fun here. You know, like, Whoa, uh, shaving the head, and we went through all that crazy stuff. And at the end of that boot camp period, then we were off to officers' candidate school. It took six months, and now we we're all infantry second lieutenants. And somewhere in that school that most of the other guys loved, I liked it, but it wasn't me, if you know what I mean. I, they said, hey, I'd rather sleep in the snow. I'd say, I'd rather sleep in a first-class hotel. I mean, there was that, you know what I mean? I wasn't eagerly seeking to go out and do these things. And uh, there was a training movie about pilots, and I saw that, and the pilots were at a bar in this movie, in the beginning of it. And they were talking with their hand. They had scarves, and there was all, like, some blondes were milling around in the background. And, and then they showed some planes, and they were just, you know, flying around. And uh, so I asked this major, I said, what's this pilot stuff? And he said, oh, you don't want that. You'd have to sign up for three more years. I said, I could take three more years. What is that pilot stuff? Oh, you, you know, you got to pass it physically. He gave me all the paperwork. Well, I made it. I got through all that stuff, and now I'm going to flight school in Pensacola. And I had met someone, and we got married in that interval. Very happy event, and we got on a plane to go to Pensacola, and I got airsick on the plane going down. <laughs> <laughs> I had never even seen an airplane, you know, up close. And I got sick in the old SNJ down in Pensacola for the first six flights, and it didn't look good for this particular guy but then that motion sickness went away and I had found that I had found something that I was excellent at it was right up my alley I just suddenly became very good at everything and uh, went through that it was an 18 month school and I got through that got into jets got over to Japan the Korean War had ended so all we were doing in Japan was defending against something and partying and it was a wonderful time. I, I just love it. Um, that was a long time ago. That was in 56. And I still think about that, how wonderful it was and how much I regret that I my drinking ruined that um, career that I had going. I, I just think back on how wonderful it was. And I had a, I just went to the museum in Pensacola recently and saw all the planes that we flew and I started thinking about that particular squadron. I was in some other squadrons, but that one was the first one. There was just that group of guys and I had run across one of them. Uh, talked to him on the phone about 10 years ago and I, something made me call him last week and I said, um, Hardy, um, why don't we get you and anybody else you can think of from that squadron we'll meet in Pensacola and go to that museum. And he said, Sandy, next weekend, that's the weekend after this, there's a Marine Corps Aviation Association meeting in Newburn. There's going to be seven guys from that squadron there. And so I'm going next weekend, and I'm going to see all those guys. So I am like a little kid in a, in a candy store. To just see, it just means a lot to me. But in the middle of that, that was a very big drinking thing of a, God, we drank as a squadron, went into, into the officers club and there was a table reserved and the colonel sat up at the front and we drank in, by rounds. You didn't order drink on your own. The colonel would go, okay, bring another round. And so everyone drank the same thing. I bet everybody would drink 15 drinks. It was just like you were in the heaven, you know. 
there was just all this partying and then going up. And I tell you all that because about six months into this, this incident occurred, and I it's still I can still remember it, and I had no idea what it what it was. But I was standing out in the end of the runway, we were practicing to go aboard the carrier, and you do these field carrier practice landings. And this major and I were standing out there, watching some of our squadron mates practice these landings. Oh, look at that guy! He's, oh, he's too high! We're just talking and carrying on. And he started talking about how he could hardly wait to get promoted to lieutenant colonel because he was going to get his own fighter squadron. He was a big Irish guy, and I'm going, yeah, yeah, Major, you're, you'd be the best, best CEO. Oh, man, he said, yeah, and I would just get nothing but the best pilots in the Marine Corps in that squadron. He said, I'd get you in that squadron. And I just felt like, oh, my God, that's a high compliment. I just felt so good. And then he said, but I wouldn't let you drink. And I, I couldn't believe that he said that because we're all getting drunk together and all that. And I realize now that in the middle of that incredible high level of drinking, I stood out. You know what I'm saying? That an alcoholic, even in that environment, that those guys were looking over going, boy, that Sandy takes it one notch further than the rest of us, doesn't he? And I just thought we were all the same. And, of course, when the tour ended and they came back to the States, then they shifted their drinking to what was socially acceptable back here. And, of course, I came back and I just drank always with the point of getting drunk. Well, this went on for 10 years, uh, maybe 11 years, and I started the, the, the disease took over. Um, we had six kids in that time and um, it looked like I was you know I got promoted to first lieutenant I got promoted to captain and it looked like I had some kind of a career going but the alcoholism was now coming in I started having withdrawals in the airplanes I would lose vision I would uh, couldn't think very clearly I was sweating and shaking and it was getting dangerous to fly with me and I started realizing that you know I'm the only guy in the plane <laughs> and, uh, so I'm getting oh, like God this is hard and eventually I, I went to a flight surgeon it got so bad I came close to buying the farm a couple of times hit the wrong switches and stuff like that and so I went there and they agreed I had a terrible problem. They sent me down to Pensacola for two weeks and the doctor studied me and there was no such thing as alcoholism um, in the Navy as a disease. No, I mean, there's plenty of alcoholics, but there was no diagnosis. You couldn't be an alcoholic. You had to be crazy or depressed or something. That was your diagnosis. And so they're studying me down there for two weeks and um, running me up in planes and all the, the dental, the psychiatrist, and all these things, they couldn't find out what was wrong, even though it was pretty obvious. I, uh, my, sh my hand shook. I was very confused. I was covered with clammy sweat. My eyes were bloodshot, and I reeked of alcohol all the time. That was, that was all there was to go on. <laughs> and... <laughs> So they left it up to the psychiatrist, and I got my right up out of there. They said, you're no longer going to be allowed to fly because you have a childhood fear of flying that just is showing up after 12 years of flying. And I knew that was crazy, but I had no way to fight it. I, was, I had nothing left inside of me to fight back against anything. And uh, it took about three months to be reassigned since I was a career officer. And uh, I got my orders to become an air traffic controller. <laughs> and um, I went to the air traffic control school in Glencoe, Georgia, and I made it through the school, which is unbelievable. And my last year of drinking, I was in charge of an air traffic control unit in Japan. And fortunately, the senior enlisted men saw me check in. And they took one look at me, and they just went, Hey, Captain, good to have you here. Here's your chair, and here's the tent, and uh, there's your coffee, and all that. Don't you personally go near the radar. You know, <laughs> We will talk to all the planes and cover for you. You just try to show up for work, which is what I did. 
And during that year, now all the restraints were gone for not drinking for 12 hours prior to flying. And so I lost um, 50 pounds to malnutrition. I stopped hanging around with my buddies, my drinking buddies. They said, hey, we're going to happy hour. You want to go? No, I'm going to stay in the hut. And I would stay there and just drink grain alcohol and vodka and juice was the only thing I could eat. I was trying to subsist on juice. And so I was very sick when that year ended and I came back to Quantico to go to a career school. And in the middle of that school, I had a grand mal seizure and almost bit my tongue and they carried me off to the hospital. And even up there, they were going, well, what could have caused this convulsion? You know, we're still in the dark ages. And after five days without alcohol, I went into the DTs and saw all kinds of CIA stuff in my room, and they were trying to drive me crazy, and I was keeping notes, and it was like Mission Impossible. And it was absolutely terrifying. Um, and somewhere, I, evidently, I just jumped up and started screaming up and down the halls, and they grabbed me and put me in a straitjacket and locked me up in the nut ward for six months. And uh, so I was in there with uh, two other alcoholics and a bunch of crazy people. <laughs> and it was obvious after a few months that the crazy people resented that the alcoholics were in there. <laughs> because it really wasn't a legitimate mental illness. Um, but AA talked that head psychiatrist into allowing uh, them to bring an AA meeting in. And so I got to AA when a corpsman came on the nut ward. All drunks fall in, right face. <laughs> Went down to a meeting, and I really thought it was great what those guys talked about, but I didn't see where it was for me. And uh, so when I was made an outpatient, I, um, and I'm going home, but i got to come back during the day, I had a few drinks one weekend, and then I really got drunk the next weekend. I knew they were going to catch me, and on Pearl Harbor Day, 1964, I called AA from my home, and they sent over my sponsor, who was another Marine captain, and he just came into my house, and he asked my family about my drinking. He didn't ask me, and they all squealed on me. My kids said, whoa, he's the worst father in the world. My wife said, he, I hate him. He's terrible. He's rotten. And off we went to a meeting, and I haven't had a drink since. I came back, and this guy just nurtured me. A um, couple of years of going to meetings every night, and I didn't get promoted to major, and I was thrown out of the Marine Corps. And I had to start over with all these kids and try and get a job, and I had this big resentment. I remember, you know, I wouldn't say this to anybody else, but by myself, I would go, Hey, God, thanks a lot. <laughs> I turned my life over to you and you crapped all over my family thank you God I really really appreciate it God thank you God I mean boy I was just I had a very bad resentment and uh, probably three months after I was out in this civilian life there was a little story in the Washington Post one paragraph, I don't know how, I just happened to see it, and it said, Marine Corps instruction team killed in plane crash in Denver. It was my unit. All the guys I had been with for the last year flying around to put on these various um, training shows that were going to Denver, and the plane flew into a mountain out there, and they were all killed, and if I had had my way and gotten promoted, I would have been on that plane. And so I remember looking at that, and the first thing that occurred to me when I read it was, God knows I just read this. So I'm going, oh, well, listen, God. Um, <laughs> if you had just told me this was going to happen, I don't think I would have had all of these bad feelings about you. <laughs> so I guess it gave me a little um, sense that you never know. When something bad happens, maybe it's good. Uh, there's so many spiritual paradoxes. And that started me down the road. I, ha I got out and I did get some other jobs and I uh, ended up in Washington, D.C. My last 23 years, I was a lobbyist for the credit union movement. And they're, that's a great group, all the credit unions in the country. Uh, they do some great work. So it was fun to work on their behalf. And um, 
about four years, five years ago, I retired and went down to Tampa. And I love it down there. I'm sponsoring about 20 guys and go to six meetings a week and get off to these conventions uh, quite a bit of the time. And AA just means the world to me. It is, um, it is just everything. But in addition, you know, we have, all, we have these wonderful conventions and meetings and all of that. But the purpose of those meetings and conventions and all that is to motivate us to establish a personal relationship with a God of your understanding. Because that is the point of Alcoholics Anonymous. is for you as an individual to establish a conscious contact, a personal awareness that there is this spirit of the universe inside of you that makes life wonderful. Now, if you had asked me before I started working these steps, Sandy, have you ever had any evidence of God anywhere? I would have said no, and you could have put a lie detector on me, and it would have said, yeah, he's telling the truth. I never had any awareness. I had heard about it. People had taught me about it, but I didn't have any awareness of a higher power. And you explained to me, of course you didn't. You are cut off from the spirit of the universe. Your character defects and your self-centeredness are blocking you from the most important thing that you can find. As a matter of fact, the purpose of being alive is to find that power. That's why we're here. And so he said, we have these 12 steps, and they are designed to cut through all of the blockages until the channel, like the prayer of St. Francis, until the channel is opened and you experience this transformation. So that don't worry about with the moral issue of these character defects. Just look at them as blockages. You know what I mean? There's this channel and it's all filled with this junk and nothing can flow through that spiritual channel. So we got some steps that are going to get that stuff out of the way and then you're going to experience something that is the most important thing you can experience. Do you remember the wonder of the first drink and how with those 30 guys, do you remember that stand? Oh, yeah. This is way beyond that. This is way beyond that. And I'm going, boy, this is just amazing. And so I started like anybody else going through this stuff and not believing in it. I mean, what's there to believe? I'm just looking at these steps and they're going, well, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do this. And I'm resisting it. i got my old ideas about this punishing God with the crucifix up there. And so, when are you going to come up to me and say to me, Sandy, we're going to sit down tonight and we're going to explain the AA God to you so that you can believe in it. Turns out there is no AA God. Nobody's going to explain anything. There is no, if there's 500 people in this room, there's 500 higher powers. So there is no. So where do, how does AA get us to believe in this? Well, I, of all the places where this is explained, it's in the most unlikely place in the book. It's in the chapter of the agnostic. What a place to hide it, huh? <laughs> I remember when I first got the big book and my sponsor said, everything you need to know is in here. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, Phil, I need money. I don't need this book. I don't need anything, you know. But I could tell that he wanted me to read it. And I looked in there and I said, oh, God, what is this? But I went through and I pushed the pages, made them look like they've been read. I put <laughs> magic marker, you know, wow, 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 in a few places. And so while I was doctoring up the book, I saw the chapter to the agnostic. And like you, I knew what was in it without reading it. <laughs> that that was the chapter that the agnostics used to stay sober. And then the rest of the non-agnostics did the steps and did all the rest of it. And, of course, later on when I became more familiar with the book, I, if you're new, I can tell you what the chapter of the agnostic says in three words. Change your mind. That's what it says. <laughs> Become a former agnostic. That's what it says. But there's a wonderful introduction in there. If you're new, I want you to listen because this is getting spiritual. We're going to get spiritual right now. 
It says in there, in the very first paragraph, if when you drink, you have little control over the amount you drink. Uh-oh, that's me. Okay. And if when you try to stop, you can't stay stopped. Uh-oh, okay, that's me. Well, then you're probably an alcoholic. Okay, I go along with that. I'm an alcoholic. Then comes the clincher. If that be the case, then you're suffering from an illness that only a spiritual experience can conquer. And I'm looking at that and I'm going, what? <laughs> you have a spi- a, an illness that only a spirit... I remember it's been my, my sponsor. So what does that say? He says, you have an illness, Sandy, that only a spiritual experience can conquer. And I'm going, well, how many illnesses are there in the medical association directory <laughs> under the heading, illnesses that only a spiritual experience can conquer? <laughs> he says, I don't know, but this is one of them. <laughs> And I said, but Bill, I don't believe in spiritual experiences. He said, oh, you're screwed. (laughs) Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. And then he started asking me questions. And this is, this is, if you're new, I want you to answer these questions. And he said to me, Sandy, do you believe in prayer? And I said, no. Do you pray a lot? No, I don't pray, Bill. I don't like prayer, and I don't pray. Put me down for no under prayer. Well, listen, do you go to church and, or, and hang around spiritual people? No, I don't go to church. I haven't been there since I was 20 years old. I have no interest in going to church. No, put me down. No, church activity. Well, do you like to read spiritual literature? You know, some of the New Age things, anything spiritual, some of the old authors. No, Bill, I don't read anything spiritual. If I see it's in the house, I throw it out. No, I don't want anything to do with spiritual. Well, do you meditate? Do you like to sit around and contemplate the God? And the... No, I don't. I don't have anything to do with meditation. It makes me nervous to even think about it. <laughs> and then came the spiritual question. He said, uh, so listen. How's it going? (laughs) Ah, it's going awful. And he said, well, let's move to the next paragraph. So we go to the next paragraph. Now, if you're new, you're about to get spiritual. We're getting there. Next paragraph, it says, to live on a spiritual basis or to die an alcoholic death are not always easy alternatives to face. (laughs) So you you know what that says? You're on a quiz program. You're the contestant up on the stage. And I'm the quiz master. And I go, well, this is where you have arrived. There's two doors back here. You have to choose one. Live on a spiritual basis or die an alcoholic death. (laughs) And if you're like the rest of us, you're going to do this. Ooh. 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 Whoa. Oh. 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 Two bad choices. Oh. Oh. I, um, I may have to call my doctor and say, Doctor, I have a friend who'd like to know how bad an alcoholic death is. <laughs> because I know what living on a spiritual basis is. That's going to be like Mother Teresa. What is that? I mean, God, you probably, probably, you probably give everything away to the poor and you have nothing. I, mean, I had no idea what live on a spiritual basis was. But all of a sudden, there was nowhere else to go. There was no other door. There was nowhere to go. Do you want an alcoholic death? Or do you want to live on a spiritual basis? Because that's where you are now. And that's what happens when you take the first step. You're powerless over alcohol and there's anything you can do. Now, I'm not going to go through all the steps, but I do want to say, for those of you that are new, about what it means to be powerless over alcohol, because sometimes that's misunderstood. Very often we think that it means whenever I drink, I lose control and all these bad things happen. That's not the part that kills you. Because if that was the only problem you have, all you'd have to do is not drink. 
and everything would be fine. No, it's quite different than that. This is what powerless is. You go to treatment, you attend lectures on alcoholism for 28 days until you understand alcoholism as well as the doctor does. You've had everything explained to you from liver disease to Jake leg to itching to alcoholic blindness to everything. And you understand to the heart of your soul that you're an alcoholic and if you ever drink again, you're going to die. And do you know how much you to stay sober? Not at all. Doesn't help at all. It does not help because it doesn't say that we're ignorant about alcoholism. It says we're powerless over it. And there will come a day when you have no defense against the first drink. And you'll be standing maybe in your old favorite bar where you're now drinking Coke and having hamburgers and you'll be talking to the bartender and you'll go, you know, I'm an alcoholic. I went through treatment. I understand alcoholism. If I ever drink, I'll lose my family. And the doctor explained, I'll pro could I have a beer? I, I will probably, I will probably, and you explain this whole thing as you drink a beer. We have no defense against the first drink. So it isn't that if you drink, you're going to get in trouble. It's if you don't have a miracle, you will drink. And so that's what powerless means. Unless we find a power to protect us from that first drink, we're going to take it. And then when we take it, the other part of the disease kicks in and we've been had. So what happens in AA about this? How do we get spiritual? AA does not try to convince us of the existence of God. It convinces us of the need for God. And as soon as you understand how much you need God, you're going to find him. Because you're going to take these steps... You know, Dr. Young made a wonderful thing when Roland Hazard went to see him and, um, you know, this wonderful psychiatrist. And Roland went there for a year and then Dr. Young said, I've done everything I can. And then he went off and went to Paris and somebody asked him the wrong question. Would you like a drink? And he said, yes. And um, he's back at Dr. Young's and um, he said, Dr. Young, I'm sorry I went back to drinking. You told me that if I drank again, I'd end up in a sanatorium. And what can you do? And this is where AA's first, where the, you know, the A and B at the end of chapter 5, that we're alcoholic and cannot manage our own life and probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. Well, Dr. Young had to be the epitome of human power at that time. There wasn't any place else you could go. And this representative of all human power looked at Roland when Roland said, what can you do? And Dr. Young said, there's nothing I can do for you. And it caused Roland to surrender to such a level that he was open for anything. And Dr. Young said, now I have heard of some alcoholics of your type who have had profound spiritual experiences and were able to live happily and sober. If I was you, I would go try and find a profound spiritual experience and the Oxford group was very popular at that time and he joined one got sober he's 12 step Ebby Ebby 12 step Bill Wilson and we're off and running yeah. with Alcoholics Anonymous and many years later Bill Wilson realized he had never closed the loop with Dr. Young in Switzerland so he wrote him a letter saying God I don't know if you remember Roland Hazard but he saw you in 19... 31 or whenever it was and um, as a result of what you told him and you cite him on this path we started this new fellowship it is now in 30 countries and we have 600,000 sober people and we owe a great deal of it to you and I've never acknowledged it so I want you to have this letter etc etc and Dr. Young wrote him back right before he died and he said, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. I often wondered what happened to Mr. Hazard. I'm so glad to hear about Alcoholics Anonymous. It's just so wonderful. I'm so grateful I played a small part in it. Back when Mr. Hazard was seeing me, it was not safe for me to talk as a psychiatrist about spiritual things because my peers would have laughed me out of the profession. But now it's quite safe. 
and we all know that Jung is a very spiritual psychiatrist, and a lot of people have studied some of his teachings. And he said, now it's safe for me to talk about spiritual matters. And he said, what I was trying to induce in Roland through psychiatric ways was to have this profound transformation as a person. And uh, I'm glad that he was able to find that, because I've always felt that that's exactly what alcoholism is. And he went on, and his words were spiritus contra spiritu. And... Um, what, reading through the lines, what he was saying is, alcoholism, I love this definition, is an inordinate longing for God. That we as alcoholics knew there was something missing inside of us. And we were keenly aware that this was missing. We didn't know what it was. We thought it was money. We thought it was sex. We thought it was something. And we found it in alcohol. It appeared to fix this. And alcohol is sort of a spiritual power because it transforms us and transforms the world. And we thought we had solved this fundamental hole that was inside of us. And Jung was so on to it. He said, now you come into Alcoholics Anonymous and we're going to teach you how to open this channel to this higher power and you're going to find all of that is resolved. And you will be... You won't be looking anymore. And so it hits down. The thing I want to close on is C. I went through A, B, and I'll go to C now. Everybody knows what it says. No human power could have relieved our alcoholism, but God could and would. Ah, those are the three words, or four words, if he were sought. I think sometimes we read it that God could and would. You know what I mean? That God could and would. Yeah, he could and he would if he were sought. So what is seeking? I remember th thinking about that. Okay, if he were sought. Well, what is seeking? So I started thinking about seeking. And maybe you've all had this same experience with seeking. The first time I remember hearing the word seek was in school. And the teacher said, we're going to play hide and seek. And I went, okay, sounds cool. Yeah, one of you is going to hide. And the other, hide your eyes, and then we go, go, go find them. And I remember, you know, hey, great. And then you start out. Mm -hmm. Where the heck is Johnny hiding? You know, I'm going up the trail. I'm going over here. I mean, we're putting a, quite a bit of effort into seeking. You remember that? But if you don't find them in about five minutes, eh, the hell with Johnny. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, it was one level of seeking, but it certainly wasn't the highest level of seeking. So the next one I remember was Easter baskets. Remember that? It was 16 pounds of solid chocolate. <laughs> and your mother has hidden it somewhere. Well, I could go much longer than five minutes on that one. I mean, it was like, wow. wow man. But maybe after 15 minutes, oh, Mom, am I warm? Can you give me a clue? And it started to wane, you know what I mean? As much as you love chocolate, it was like, uh, you know, this is getting boring. I don't know if I can keep on seeking. You start begging and whining, and finally they, all right. So you get the chocolate. So there's another level of seeking. But the highest level of seeking that I recall having was when I was about 14, and we had a golden retriever that had been in the family for about five years. And he ran away and never came back. And he ran into those woods, you know, over there. That's where I came home. My mother and father said, I don't know, he ran in those woods. In there. And I went over those woods looking for that dog. And I was into advanced seeking. Any of you that have lost a dog know what I'm talking about. I would be out by those woods every day after school, tosser, 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 and I'd go in there, and I'd look, and I'd call, and I'd leave dog food. Year after year, I would go back there with the dream that maybe that dog would come back. So I would call that a pretty high level of seeking. And then the question comes, what level have I put in the sea? God couldn't would if he were... Easter egg 
seeking, hide and seek. Okay, if I don't find him in five minutes, the hell with it. Up at the lost dog level? Or is it possible to go beyond that? Isn't it essential that that become the focus of our lives? Is to find this, the ultimate treasure. You talk about a hidden treasure that people go looking for buried treasure and spend millions and billions and dig up a pirate's treasure. Look what we're about to discover if we will persist in that seeking. It's the ultimate jackpot. So those of you that are new, I urge you, please don't give up. Don't think you're not going to find it. It's going to happen just around the corner. You're in for much more than sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous. You're in for the epic journey of your life. And Godspeed. And thank you all very much.